Welcome to Double Portion Inheritance with Maria Marola and Gary Wold, brought to you by DoublePortionInheritance.com. Since 1981, Maria heard the call of Yahuwah to become a watchman to the House of Yisrael and to those within the traditional Christian church. She was instructed to warn them against the false doctrines and pagan traditions of men. After 25 years of studying scripture, the word of Yahuwah came to Maria again in 2007 as she was called out of the corporate world to become a full-time intercessor and prophetic teacher. The name of the ministry, Double Portion Inheritance, was given to her after she received the revelation of the two houses of Israel from Ezekiel 37:16. The mission of this ministry is to bring together the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph for the return of the Messiah, Yahushua. And now, Maria Marola. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Today is December the 18th, 2021. And the name of our program today is, Are You Cheating on Your Bridegroom by Celebrating False Holidays? And uh, we're going to go through a, just a quick little um, skim through of this blog I just wrote called Six Reasons Why Celebrating Christ Mass. And I spell it this way on purpose, Christ Mass. Because I want people to be aware that, you know, Christ Mass comes from the Roman Catholic Mass. Okay, the Roman Catholic Mass um, in the Catholic Church, they teach that at every Mass, our Messiah is being crucified afresh as though he were never sacrificed. And I hope you realize what an abomination that is. Because we are told in Romans 6, 10, I believe it is, that he died unto sin once, once, okay? And um, I'm opening up my e so I can look up that uh, passage for you. I think it's Romans 6, 10. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he lives, he lives unto Elohim. And then the other passage of scripture is in Hebrew 6.6. 6, and it tells us that if they fall, if they shall fall away, you know, this is talking about, you know, it starts out with saying, for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the word of Elohim and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of Elohim afresh and put him to an open shame. So the Roman Catholic Mass crucifies the son of Elohim afresh and puts him to an open shame. And that's what people need to understand. There's several reasons why Christmas is an abomination, but very few people understand the Roman Catholic mass part of it, right? Yes, it's the wrong date. We understand that part, but there's so much more. And so, I'm just going to run through this really quickly. The number one reason is that's the wrong date of December 25th, which is the season of the winter solstice, was chosen deliberately by Mystery Babylon religion to lump in the real Messiah with all the imposters of false pagan religions. Okay. Now I want to warn you, there are a few messianics out there that are trying to discredit this information and they will tell you, oh, there's no place anywhere in academia where it says that all these pagan gods were born on December 25th. That's what they try and tell you. Okay. What we have to understand is that it doesn't matter whether Nimrod really did marry his mother, Semiramis, or, you know, we know the Bible never mentions a woman by the name of Semiramis. Well, actually, it mentions the name Semiramis. Um, it's in Hebrew, uh, which I'll go over that later. But the point is, in the um, occult world, 
they have, you know, formulated all these different myths, you know, in the occult world, they have all this mythology that they follow as part of practicing their mystery Babylon religion. And part of the myth, and, and you know, was a teenager, I used to go to the library and I would check out a lot of occult books back then because I was being raised in the Catholic Church and I was disillusioned with what I thought was Christianity in those days. And I thought, well, if that's what the, you know, the Catholic nuns were so evil and so abusive. And I thought, well, geez, if this is what Christianity is, I want no part of it. So as a teenager, I went to the library and I checked out books on other religions because I was seeking. And I found out through my research as a teenager <laughs> that other religions, there were, there are many in the in the nations that teach that their pagan sun god was reincarnated at the winter solstice, which at this period of time is on December 25th. However, you know, over the years, over the thousands of years, um, there's been uh, polar shifts. And there was a time when the vernal equinox used to be on December 20, or I'm sorry, in March 25th. March 25th used to be the vernal equinox when the pagans used to sacrifice babies to Easter, the pagan goddess named Easter. But now we have had enough polar shifts from different tsunamis and earthquakes around the world that the, the vernal equinox keeps coming sooner and sooner. I think this past year it was on the 20th. I think the year before that it was on March 19th. So, you know, uh, there was a time when the uh, winter solstice used to fall on January the 6th. So when people say December 25th, uh, the rebirth of the sun was supposed to fall three days and three nights after the winter solstice, where they believed that the sun was re being rebirthed. Okay. Now there are enough clues in scripture in Ezekiel chapter eight, particularly if you go to, uh, with me to Ezekiel chapter eight, there's enough clues to tell us that this pagan religion exists, exists, you know, because Yahuwah taught Ezekiel, he said, um, you know, he, he said to him, I want you, Ezekiel, to look in the inner, the door of the inner gate, you know, of Jerusalem, because he, he brought him in the vision. OK, he was he was being shown in a vision. Um, and he says, the, the spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of Elohim to Yerushalayim to the door of the inner gate that looks towards the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy. Now, most people wouldn't know what, what that's about. They would say, well, what's, what's the image of jealousy? Okay. Well, if you understand anything about this occult religion, the occult religion teaches that uh, Nimrod married his mother who they purport is Semiramis. And I know the Bible doesn't talk about this, but, you know, there's various different versions of the story because you have to understand, after the Tower of Babel, this religion migrated to all the nations of the world. And so each nation where this religion migrated, the story took on different names, different languages. You know, the story kind of, evolved. And so each culture has their own version of the story. And, you know, each, each version of the story is slightly different. So the image of jealousy, the, so according to the myth, and I, and I, I, I want to highlight this as a myth. Okay. It's a myth. This pagan myth, Nimrod married his mother, his wife, you know, he married his own mother and she was known as the queen of heaven. And that's mentioned in Jeremiah chapter seven and also in Jeremiah chapter 44. 
the Queen of Heaven. Incidentally, the Catholic Church to this day has renamed Mary or Miriam, the mother of our Messiah, the Queen of Heaven. So they've attached a false identity to her even. Not only do they preach a false Messiah, you know, as the Apostle Shaul or Paul said, if any man preaches another Yahushua or another Jesus, if you will, he says, let him be accursed, right? And so they also teach another Mary, another Miriam, a different Miriam. So they've attached the identity uh, to Miriam of all the pagan goddesses of antiquity. So supposedly what happened was, um, I mean, this is what the pagan myth teaches, that Nimrod and his mother built the Tower of Babel and they started this religion where they would sacrifice babies to Moloch. And we know they did this and they still do to this day. You know, they still do. I mean, even recently on Instagram um, and on Twitter, there is a, uh, the Satanists are advertising for women that are pregnant to come forward and they will pay for their abortion if they will allow their aborted child to be used in a satanic ritual. This is absolutely evil to the core. And so what happened was in this pagan myth was that um, Nimrod was killed for his many crimes. Now, some people claim it was Shem, the son of Noah, who killed Nimrod. The book of Jasher says it was Esau. There's all these variations of the story. It doesn't really matter because, you see, it's a myth. It's not, the, it's not true history anyway. Th this whole religion is based on mythology. So we're not putting forth true history. We're putting forth mythology and we're showing people, look, the mythology behind this religion is teaches that Nimrod was killed for his many crimes against children and his body parts were delivered to the 10 provinces in the land of Shinar. And we know in Genesis chapter 10, right here, Genesis 10, it says that Nimrod ruled over 10 provinces in the land of Shinar. Okay. And all of his body parts were delivered to these different provinces according to mythology. And so his wife slash mother couldn't find one part of his body. And the one part that could not be found was his phallus, his phallus. This is what's called the image of jealousy. It's the it's called an Egyptian obelisk. And it is supposed to represent Nimrod's phallus. Okay. The only body part that was never found. Well, when scripture mentions the image of jealousy, that's what it's referring to. Okay. And, and I know this because I've done extensive research into the occult pagan myth that's behind the story. Okay. And so that's what this image of jealousy is. And if you go down further to Ezekiel 8.14... It says, Ezekiel says, then he brought me to the door of the gate of Yahuwah's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Now, of course, I always wonder what's that all about? Well, in pagan mythology, they believe that after Nimrod died, he impregnated his mother slash wife by the rays of the sun, because they claim that Nimrod was reincarnated as the god of the sun, and that with the rays of the sun, he impregnated her, and she became pregnant with Tammuz, their son. And when Tammuz was 40 years old, he was hunting for, and he killed a wild boar, a pig, and he was killed by a wild boar in a hunting accident. And so for 40 days, they would have Lent. In the Catholic Church, they call this Lent. 
It's the 40 days leading up to Easter Sunday when the, you know, for 40 days they weep for Tammuz and for every day that they weep for Tammuz in this life that it helps uh, Nim, I mean, Tammuz have, you know, a better life in the underworld. And so that's what this custom is all about. They weep for Tammuz. I remember growing up in the Catholic Church as a child and the nuns would tell us, you know, you have to give something up for Lent. Lent. And, you know, we would give up a TV show or we would give up a certain, I don't know, a food or a dessert that we liked. We'd give up something and she would write on the chalkboard, what are you giving up? And, you know, everybody would say, oh, I'm giving this up for Lent. It's ridiculous. Okay. And I remember the nuns telling us that it was the same 40 days that Yahushua or, you know, as they called him, Jesus was in the wilderness fasting for 40 days. Well, that's not true. He didn't fast in the wilderness leading up to Passover. His fasting in the wilderness began on the first of Elul up to leading up to Yom Kippur. Okay, because even to this day, the Jewish people have a tradition. And even though it's a tradition, it is a tradition rooted in scripture. And they have a tradition of of fasting and praying for those 40 days leading up to Yom Kippur. It's the 40 days of Teshuvah. Uh, and, and where they get that from is when Moses went up to get the second set of Ten Commandments after the golden calf incident. He was there for 40 more days. Okay, so during those 40 days, when Moses went up the second time around, he was up there for 40 days leading up to Yom Kippur. And when he came back down, he presented them with the stone tablets and sprinkled them with the blood of a a goat. Okay. And you could understand why the people in Moses' time would be praying and sort of in this mournful yes. seeking out Yahuwah because they blew it big time. They had how many people die right. because of the golden calf incident. So yeah. it's with that, with those people's lives having been mm-hmm. taken, mm-hmm. now he's going up and they're like, oh my, we really blew it. And they're just pleading in prayer right, and very somber. Right. You know, so not all traditions in Judaism are bad traditions. They're traditions rooted in scripture. And so when Messiah went into his 40 day fast in the wilderness, it was during the 40 days of Teshuvah, the 40 days of repentance, uh, right out of his baptism. You know, uh, the Ruach HaKodesh led him into the wilderness, just like the scapegoat would be led into the wilderness. Uh for Yom Kippur, okay? And that's for another teaching. But anyway, the point is that these 40 days of weeping for Tammuz, the Catholic Church has tried to assimilate that into the 40 days when Messiah was fasting in the wilderness. But no, it's the diff- It's not the same period. He fasted in the wilderness for 40 days uh, leading up to Yom Kippur, not leading up to Passover. So they got that one wrong. And then, you know, in Ezekiel, uh, let's see, what, what verse is it where it says they worship the sun, Ezekiel 8, 16. In fact, I'm not going to mention anybody's names, but there's one particular female teacher in messianic circles, and she's got a blog, and, and she claims that um, the ancient Israelites did not worship the sun. She goes, oh, I don't know where people are getting this from, but Israel never worshipped the sun. Oh, really? She must not read her scripture because right here it says in Ezekiel 8, 16, and he brought me into the inner court of Yahuwah's house and behold, at the door of the temple of Yahuwah, between the porch and the altar were about five and 20 men with their backs toward the temple of Yahuwah and their faces toward the east and they worshipped the sun toward the east. So there you have it. They worship the sun. So this woman who's messianic and has this like really huge blog and a huge following, 
I'm not going to name her. Don't go too far. She's claiming that they don't, that there's no record of the Israelites ever worshiping the sun. Baloney. Baloney. Yes, they worship the sun. In fact, I think I still have, to this day, a meme that I created showing Stonehenge, where every year at the winter solstice, to this day, people gather in England, in the United Kingdom. So here you have Druids worshiping and celebrating the rebirth of the sun god on December 25th, right? Because three days before December 25th is called the winter solstice. And you can see there, you know, this guy right here, he's all tattoo covered and he's, you know, they're dancing and, you know, they've even got their, they're wearing wreaths, wreaths around their, around their heads. They got their arms lifted up, praise and worship just looks just like a Christian service, if you will. And as you can see, the sun is peeping through this little window of Stonehenge where it is said that only one day out of the year can you see the sun peeping through that little window of Stonehenge. Can you guys see this? The sun peeping through the window. Okay, and it says, give me that old time religion. That's old time religion right there, you know? Christmas originated from ancient Babylonian sun worship. And there it is. There's the sun peeping through the window of Stonehenge. And you can see this bald headed woman. You know, she's, you know, acting like a temple prostitute. And she's, you know, worshiping the sun. And you can see that their hands are lifted up. They're on their knees. They're raising up their hands. They're praising the sun. You know, they're wearing the green leaves around their heads. And you could probably ask them whether or not everything that they do is correct history or not. And they may know that it's not. It doesn't matter. Again, it's, it's um, as Maria said earlier, it's the history of, of the religion, the history of these um, stories, not the history of everything that happened. Right, because say every year I get these messianic people that say, "Oh, it's not true that all these pagan sun gods were born on December twenty fifth." You have to understand, it's not that they were born as newborn babies on December twenty fifth. This the mythology is that they were reincarnated on December twenty fifth. That's what the that's what the mythology is all about. That these all these pagan deities were supposedly reincarnated. On December 25th. And they call that the rebirth of the sun. Okay. It's not that they were, you know, born out of the womb on December 25th. People get that all confused and they say, oh, there's no record of any pagan deities ever being, being born on December 25th. No, it's that the sun is being reborn on December 25th. And it says here in Ezekiel 8, 16, and they worshiped the sun towards the east. Why? Because the sun rises in the east. Okay, so no matter what part of the world you're in, it's always going to be towards the east when the sun comes up. In Amos 5, 21 through 27, it says, I hate, I despise your feast days. He doesn't say my feasts. You know, in Leviticus 23, he says, these are my feasts. When he's referring to his seven feasts, he says, these are my feasts. But when it comes to your feasts, meaning the, you know, the false holidays of pagan sun worship, he says, I hate, I despise your feast days. Therefore, will I cause you to go into captivity? So if you're listening to this as a Christian and you say, Oh, but God knows my heart. He knows my heart. Yes, he does know your heart. And because he does know your heart, you're going into captivity. You are going into captivity. So back to the blog here. 
So the wrong date of December 25th was chosen deliberately. Okay, and this would be the season of the winter solstice. It was chosen deliberately by mystery Babylon religion in order to lump our Messiah in with all the pagan imposters. Now, I want to recommend this blog that you can go back and read. It's called 16 Crucified Saviors, Why Messiah's Birthday Matters. And in this blog, I show there is a book uh, by a New Age enthusiast. His name is Kersey Graves, and he wrote this book called The World's 16 Crucified Saviors. You know, and, and you can actually read the whole book online for free. Not saying that anybody would really want to read it, but really it goes into a lot of detail where he um, falsely purports that our Messiah was born uh, on December 25th, just like all the other pagan deities. And in this chapter it says the 25th of December, the birth of the gods. So that whole chapter is dedicated to all the pagan deities that were born on December 25th. So you've got, we've got clear history about this, that people actually believe this nonsense. Okay. Um, and of course, I've got another blog called 25th, the December 25th Historical Birth, uh, birth of Historical Antichrists. Okay. And, you know, you can, you can read that in your own time. I'm not going to cover the whole thing. Bullet, pro, bullet point number two, the phrase Mary Christ Mass celebrates the blasphemous Roman Catholic Mass where their catechism expressly states that at every mass, Christ becomes the victim anew as though he were never sacrificed. Okay. And I've got another blog called what is the Roman Catholic mass? And you can read that later if you want. And then this other one called, should you be merry about Christ's mass? And my point in, Asking that question is if you understood what the term Christ mass means, it's not about his birth. It's about a re-crucifying of the son of man afresh and putting him to an open shame. But also, you know, in those days of Nimrod, they used to have child mass services, child mass services services where they would sacrifice thousands of infants on the altar to Moloch, a giant burning statue. And this infant was placed in the arms of this giant burning statue and burned alive. Think about how horrific that is, how horrible that is. And how can we be merry about that? How can we be merry about something like that? I know I'm trying to make it bigger, honey. So um, people need to understand when you say Merry Christmas, just the very phrase itself, just the very phrase itself is an absolute abomination. Okay. When I go to the grocery store and the cashier says, Merry Christmas, I cannot say Oh yeah, you too. Uh, you too. Yeah. Thank you. I can't do that because I am coming against my own conscience. If I say that, what I say to them is, well, thank you for the sentiment, but I, I don't celebrate that anymore. I, you know, I learned years ago, Christmas is not the birth of Christ at all. It's, you know, it goes all the way back to ancient, you know, ancient paganism where they used to sacrifice babies to the pagan gods. And that's what I say. And, you know, people in the checkout line look at me like with deer and headlights, like, huh? <laughs> you know, they're like, uh, this is uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't care. I'm not, I'm not going to be, I'm not comfortable with that phrase. Merry Christmas. I'm just not, you know, and I'm not going to go, Oh, thank you. That's the really sweet of you. No, I, that is an, an absolute abomination. So number three, the real Messiah had to have been born on a prophetic day of Yahuwah, a, a feast day. 
so that he would be validated as the genuine Messiah of Israel. Just think about how many Jews have been turned off to believing that Yahushua is the real and genuine Messiah because Christianity, starting with Constantine the Roman Emperor, changed his date of birth to the winter solstice on December 25th. Why? Because, you know, Constantine practiced the ancient pagan uh, Saturnalia. And at that time, you know, uh, he, he, all the Christians in Rome were against, they didn't want to keep celebrating Saturnalia. They saw how wicked it was and how pagan it was. And so, you know, Constantine came up with a brilliant idea. He said, I know we'll change Saturnalia into the birth of Christ. And therefore he kept both the pagans happy and he kept the Christians happy. And then they forbode the, the keeping of anything that had a Hebrew origin. Yeah, that he forbade. Yeah. Right. Yeah, forbid not forbode. Yeah, forbade. Yeah. 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 And and so, you know, anybody that was caught keeping Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread was tortured to death. But he changed the Passover to Easter, the pagan goddess of fertility. And I have several blogs that I've written about this. When was the real Messiah born and why does it matter? Okay, and I go into a lot of detail. I've studied the birth of Messiah since the year 2002. I have a lot of research on when he was born down to the exact hour, the exact day. Okay, and this is a pretty long blog, but it's based on the book by Ernest L. Martin called The Star That Astonished the World. And you can read his whole book online for free and you can download every MP3, which that's one of the things I really want us to do, honey, is download these MP3s before they take it away. And I mean, Dr. Martin, he died, he's dead now, but he did a phenomenal job, even, you know, based on the constellation of, of uh, Revelation 12, the woman clothed with the sun and the moon underneath her feet. Would you say he did an excellent job of not allowing his his religious uh, experience or denominational opinions to influence his research? Absolutely. I, I don't know what his, I don't even think he had a denomination. I don't know what he was, but he definitely in his book speaks out against the pagan sun gods of December 25th, you know? So he was a searcher of truth. Yeah. Then I have another blog called Why Messiah Was Born on the Feast of Trumpets Instead of Tabernacles. Some people get mad about that because, you know, Messianics and Hebrew Roots people have been told for so long that he's born on the Feast of Tabernacles. And I can understand why they would think that because, you know, a, a manger is kind of sort of reminds you of like maybe a sukkah, but they're not the same thing. A sukkah is not the same thing as a manger. But that's, you know, you'll learn that when you read the blog. He was born in a stable. That's that's the fact. He, he was born in a stable. Two weeks later, he did dwell with us in a tabernacle with his parents. So he did fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles as a two-week-old infant. You know, people say, but, but it says he came, you know, that he came to dwell among us. He tabernacled among us. Well, yeah, he did fulfill that as well as a two-week-old infant. <laughs> and as a human. Yeah, right. The whole time he was incarnate. Then I have, what is the testimony of Messiah? This one gets into, you know, Revelation 19.10. The testimony of Yahushua is the spirit of prophecy. And I get into, you know, exactly what his testimony is all about. You know, what is the testimony of Yahushua? You know, many of us have often wondered, what is what is that? Well, it's it's his feast days. So I talk about that in that blog. Now, what we're going to read today <laughs> is this blog called An Illustration of Messiah and the Christian Church, the story of Rachel Lucas and Joshua. Well, I changed the title because it was such a difficult title to, to type in and remember. I decided to change the title to Are You Cheating on Your Bridegroom by Celebrating False Holidays? 
You know, when you were talking earlier about the winter solstice and, you know, again, it was started out like as far back as when January 6th. And then at some point it was actually on the 25th and it keeps changing. It's getting earlier. Uh-huh. But you were talking about the Catholics, uh, messiahs dying anew each time they, they, um, right. they do their, their thing. Yeah. Um, and I was just thinking how sick that is if you think about it, because, you know, we know that those who are going to hell are going to be in everlasting torment, right? Exactly. Not just separated, like that's the punishment enough, but it's separation mm-hmm. and anguish. So this idea that Messiah has to die eternally every time this is done, that's akin to saying that the creator of the universe, that his spirit is being punished, you yeah. know, that that he's he's being tortured for the good thing that he did for mankind. Well, it's, it's exactly sick. like in the Jewish Talmud. I think there's something in there where it talks about they call him Yeshu and they say that he's, you know, boiling in excrement. So, you know, religion, the religion of men has has corrupted biblical truth. It's truly a miracle that we have what we have <laughs> exactly. documented and correctly translated because you know, humans will get in the way and screw things up so much. And it's, it, I really believe it's a supernatural um, thing where Yahuwah wove, wove the writing of scripture into his plan. Absolutely. That Absolutely. would survive. Um, so the name of this blog is called, Are You Cheating on Your Bridegroom by Celebrating False Holidays? Now I'm going to read, try to get through this for the next hour. We've got one more hour, you know, and then, and then after that, we're going to do the 30 minutes of Q&A. So this is a fictitious story that I wrote back in 2007. And I wrote it because, you know, when trying to explain to your family members why you're not celebrating this anymore, people say things like, but God knows my heart. And, the you know, it doesn't matter when he was born. What matters is that he was born. What matters is that he came into the world and he died for our sins. Well, on its face, that sounds really good that this really is a very convicting story. Rachel was a young Christian girl, age 21, from a very good family. She was actively involved at her church with street evangelism and missions to third world countries. A young man at her church named Lucas, who was the same age, captured her heart. The two of them fell in love, and within one year, they were engaged to be married. Rachel and Lucas had many fond memories and special dates that they celebrated together. For instance, they celebrated the anniversary of the date they first met on October 31st, 1990, at a hallelujah party at church. You know, I I know that back in the day when I was at Christian church, they changed it from Halloween to hallelujah party. And they thought that that somehow sanctified it, Okay. It was actually a Halloween party in disguise. Rachel's church had a costume party, and there were trophies and prizes for the best female Bible character and also for the best male Bible character. That year, Rachel dressed up as Delilah, the Philistine woman who enticed Samson in the book of Judges. Coincidentally, Lucas dressed up as Samson, even though they had never met before and they had not planned to dress up with matching costumes. When the votes were cast, the most votes went to Rachel and Lucas for the best male and female Bible character costumes, and they both won trophies and prizes. Everyone took videos of the two of them posing together and acting out parts from the Bible story of Samson and Delilah. They had lots of fun and laughs as Rachel chased Lucas around with fake pair of scissors, pretending like she was going to cut off all of Lucas's fake hair from his wig. That night, Rachel and Lucas went out for coffee at an all-night diner, and they talked all night and got to know one another. They became best friends from that night moving forward, and they were inseparable. At first, it seemed that their relationship was just a platonic friendship. But by December 25th of that same year, Rachel and Lucas participated in a Christmas drama at church. Rachel played the part of Mary and Lucas played the part of Joseph. They did a live nativity scene with a live baby in a manger. After the production was over, 
The entire congregation went to the basement of the church for refreshments, and that was the first time that Rachel and Lucas realized that their relationship was much more than a platonic friendship. They realized that night that they were beginning to have romantic feelings for each other, and therefore they decided that night to officially become a couple. At that point, they announced to the church members they were courting. It also happened to be Lucas's birthday on December 25th, and the entire church celebrated Lucas's birthday as well as their new relationship. As they sat for refreshments in the church basement, they viewed the video of the play that they had just performed in together. They had many fond memories of that night and many photos that they took together as a couple. The following year, that would be, you know, the Gregorian pagan year. The following year on February 14th, 1991, Rachel's church wanted Lucas and Rachel to plan a Valentine's Day dance for all the couples in the church. They had a lot of fun decorating the church auditorium with hearts, balloons, and streamers. They baked cookies together and had a blast planning for this special event. That night, when Rachel and Lucas danced together on the floor, Lucas asked Rachel to marry him, and she said yes. He told her that he had picked out a ring for her, but he was still making payments on the ring that he had chosen for her. Lucas bought Rachel a dozen long stem red roses, a box of chocolates, and a stuffed animal for Valentine's Day. They had many fond memories of that night because that is when Lucas proposed marriage and Rachel accepted. Later on that same year, Rachel and Lucas were asked by their church to help organize an Easter production on March 31st, 1991. Rachel played the part of Mary Magdalene and Lucas played the part of Judas. After the Easter production was over, Lucas and Rachel organized an Easter egg hunt. As they hid plastic colored eggs all over the church, each of the children and adults hunted for plastic eggs. Each of the eggs contained a piece of paper with a note inside that contained a number. The number in each egg corresponded to a gift that was on the table in the church auditorium. Lucas purposely planted an egg with Rachel's name on it, and he told the others to leave Rachel's egg alone. When Rachel opened up the egg that there was a diamond ring inside, Lucas got down on bended knee and proposed marriage to Rachel in front of the entire church. Everyone cheered loudly and took pictures of Rachel and Lucas together. They had officially become engaged on March 31st, Easter Sunday, and this was a special time for them to remember. Now, do you see what I did here? Okay. What I did was I'm trying to show the pagan alternative to what the Passover meal was supposed to be. The Passover meal that our Messiah had with his disciples, and I know people say that wasn't a true Passover meal. I disagree, but that's for another teaching, okay? That when, the night before he died, when he had the Passover, he told them in the, all the Gospels, all four Gospels, he says, go and prepare the Passover that we may eat it. Now, he wouldn't tell them to go and prepare the Passover that we may eat it unless he was actually going to have a Passover meal, okay? And that night he lifted up the cup and he he quoted a specific psalm, okay, which corresponds to the Messianic Jewish Seder meal where they say, I will lift up the cup of salvation, right? I will lift up the cup of salvation. And that's the fourth cup of the meal because they, they do four cups and there's something prophetic to those four cups, and what did he say in, in Luke's gospel? He says, this is the blood of my covenant shed for many. This is the blood of my covenant shed for many. And what he was doing was he, you know, there was 10 out of the 12 tribes that were divorced in Jeremiah 3, 8. And they were exiled to the nations because of their pagan holidays. And we read about that in Amos chapter five, where he says, I hate your feast days. Therefore, I will cause you to go into captivity. So the reason why these 10 lost tribes were sent into captivity in the nations is because of their 
feast days. They're false pagan feast days. So what Messiah was doing is he was opening up the way for those lost tribes to come back to him and be married to him again. That was an engagement. That meal that he shared with his disciples the night before he died was an engagement meal. This is where mainstream Christianity really screws up on this topic, is they think that it's talking about the feasts of Yahuwah. They think it's talking about the Jewish feasts. I hate your feast days. Mm -hmm. And it's it's so incorrect. A popular evangelist said this uh, recently, that Jesus sinned. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't say it quite like that, but basically... He, 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 what it was about was the lepers. He healed the lepers, and it says he touched the lepers, and he violated the law of Moses right. by touching the lepers. Which is breaking of the commandments given by Yahuwah, which means he sinned. He so, said that he violated the law of Moses. But what he doesn't understand is that the lepers were told to be brought to the priest in the temple, and the priests were supposed to anoint them with oil. So the, so the priests were commanded to touch the lepers. And they were the ones who not only anointed them, which was the medical procedure of, of cleansing, but it was also they were the doctors who were supposed to make the evaluation. Yeah, exactly. So it wasn't just I'm going there for a miracle. It was that's the proper protocol anyway. So my point in saying that was that you have to correctly interpret this as not Yahuwah's feasts as being the pagan stuff going on. Mm -hmm. That's my point. Right. So the point is that you know, the Catholic Church has replaced the Passover meal, which is the engagement, right? The engagement, Yahushua gets engaged to be married to his divorced wife, ancient Israel, right? The 10 lost tribes. That was his engagement meal. Now, the reason that was so miraculous is because in Deuteronomy 24, we are told that if a man takes a wife and he finds some uncleanness in her, he may write her a certificate of divorce, place it into her hand and send her out of his house. And then it says she may go and become another man's wife. Okay. A, a remarriage following a divorce is not a sin as people in the church often try to teach. Okay. It's not a sin to get remarried after a divorce, okay? If the, if the husband's the one that initiates the divorce and he has a just cause to divorce her, and, a, and it says for uncleanness, that word uncleanness can mean either adultery or he thought she was a virgin on the wedding night and, and it turned out she wasn't a virgin. So he married her under false pretenses. Yeah, fraud. Those are the only two reasons the husband could divorce his wife. But there's a custom. It's not in scripture, but there's a custom that says that if the man still loved her anyway, and he still wanted to marry her, even after he found out she wasn't a virgin, he could take a lamb, he could slaughter the lamb and place the blood of that lamb on the bed sheet. And he would take the bed sheet outside to the crowd, show the bed sheet to the crowd and the blood of the lamb would cover her sin. Okay. Now, even though that's a, it's, you know, it's a tradition, it's in the Talmud. I don't believe that's a, it's an evil tradition. I believe that's a, a prophetic tradition that points to the blood of Messiah, how his blood covers our sin. Covers her shame. Yeah. Covers her shame. I think that's beautiful, right? Not all traditions in the Talmud are evil. Some of them are, but a lot of them are not. A lot of them are prophetic. So there, there could be some evil stuff in the Talmud, but there's also some stuff in the Talmud that's prophetic too. And But getting back to what, what I'm saying is that according to Deuteronomy 24, it says that if the second husband that the divorced wife gets married to, if he decides he doesn't want her anymore either, if he decides if he dies or if he divorces her, she may never go back to the first husband. Never. It says for if she does this, it will cause the land to sin. It will cause the land to sin. And this is the reason why the kingdom of Judah would not allow the 10 northern tribes, the 10 lost tribes to return. 
This is why they had such disdain for the Samaritans. Now you can understand why. Because they're going by Deuteronomy 24. However, what they didn't take into account was that in Hosea chapter 2, there's a prophecy about how even though these lost tribes of Israel went after their lovers, right, that a day was going to come where they were going to say, I will return to my first husband. That's in Hosea chapter 2, verse 7. It says, I will return to my first husband, for then it was better with me than now. And at the end of that chapter, he says, I will betroth you unto me in righteousness and in loving kindness and in tender mercies. Now, wait a minute. How in the world is he going to take the divorced wife back again if Deuteronomy 24 says it's impossible? I think people interpret, you know, that scripture. They look past the word, I will return to my first husband. I think they misinterpret that to say, I will return back to my ex-husband, you know, the one of my youth. I think that's how they mentally perceive it. But, that but is... it says first. Yeah. So there, as you say all the time, there's a second. There's a second husband, right. So Israel got married to her Baalim, her false pagan deities. That's why she said, I will return to my first husband. When she says my first husband, it implies she had a second husband. Okay, the, uh, the second husband would be the false pagan deities. Her lovers, okay? So the, but you know, Deuteronomy 24 says she can't return to for her first husband. So how is this possible? We have to find a way to bridge the gap between Deuteronomy 24 and Hosea chapter 2, verse 7. How's that possible? Well, you see, Romans chapter 7 tells us, the apostle Shaul tells us that when the husband dies, she is no longer under that law of her husband. Christians read that and they think it means we're no longer required to obey any of the law of Moses. No, he's saying she's not under that law, the law of her husband, the law that prevents her from going back to him. So when he died, the law of divorce died with him. The law of Deuteronomy 24 died with him. Now she is able to be married to another, even to him that is raised from the dead. See that? His dying enabled the 10 lost tribes to be married to him again. Because the law is only in effect as long as the parties live. As soon as one party dies, it's, it's null and void. And that's proof right there that the son is the same being as the father, Yahuwah, Elohim. Unless, like I always joke about, did Yahuwah make a way for his son to marry his ex-wife? Right, that's an abomination. That's I mean, disgusting. in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was a man in that congregation that would, that had his father's wife, okay? And he says that that was a sin, okay? So, yeah, the father did not send his son to marry his ex-wife. The son is the father come in human flesh. And, and so many people can't get this through their head. It was him. The law of, of marriage and divorce is the only reason Yahuwah had to come in his physical uh, right. body in the first place. Exactly. So it was him. He came. He put on a, a finite body of flesh and came to be to remarry Israel. Okay. Oh, now I digress. So let me finish the story here. Lucas and Rachel decided to set their wedding date for Easter Sunday. Two years into the future, on April the 11th in 1993, they, they began to plan an Easter wedding with pastel colors like seafoam green, lavender, pale yellow, pink, robin egg blue, etc. As you can see, I have got the bridesmaids wearing all those Easter colors. Um, and for the next two years, Lucas and Rachel began to celebrate all these important feast days as they plan their future wedding. 
Each time one of these important dates arrived, Rachel and Lucas planned a special party where they could get together with friends and family and reminisce about the important landmarks that took place on those dates. For instance, they celebrated October 31st Halloween with new meaning now for it commemorated the time when Lucas and Rachel had met for the first time and they had both won the Best Costume Award that year. They also celebrated December 25th Christmas with new meaning as well for it represented the first time that Lucas and Rachel began to court. They also celebrated Valentine's Day, February 14th each year because it commemorated when Lucas proposed to Rachel. They also celebrated Easter Sunday now with new meaning for it represented the time when Lucas presented Rachel with a ring and proposed in front of the entire church. As each anniversary date of one of these special events came up, Rachel and Lucas would plan a special party to celebrate their love for each other. They got together with friends and family as Rachel would prepare all of Lucas's favorite foods that she had learned to prepare just for him. They played their favorite songs, which reminded them of when they had first met. They displayed images, photos, and symbols of things that reminded them of their relationship together. They held these special parties to celebrate each event that memorialized something special that took place in their relationship as they would invite friends and families to participate with them. They would recall the reason for the season and tell stories of when they first met, when they first kissed, when they first became engaged, and so on. But as time went on, their relationship began to experience problems. Lucas did not always display his faithfulness to Rachel as she had done to him. Rachel began to see changes in Lucas as he became addicted to video games and vampire movies, which caused him to become withdrawn and have mood swings. She also noticed that Lucas flirted with other women in her presence, and he would often become short-tempered and angry with her over petty things. Rachel prayed for Lucas to change his ways, but she realized after two years of engagement that Lucas was not the right man for her. She loved Lucas very much, but she knew that he was not the one whom the Father in Heaven had chosen for her to marry. Finally, after much heartache, Rachel had to come to the decision to break things off with Lucas just one month before they were scheduled to get married on Easter Sunday, 1993. Rachel's friends and family were devastated because they all loved Lucas and they all enjoyed participating in the celebrations that Lucas and Rachel held in order to commemorate their love together. After Rachel and Lucas broke up, Rachel no longer felt comfortable attending her old church. So she started to attend church less frequently. Her friends began to wonder why she was not in church each week. Rachel felt very sad and depressed about the fact that she had to break up with Lucas and she knew that she would miss her old church family. But no matter how sad she felt, she did not want to go back to that dysfunctional relationship with Lucas. Not too long after Rachel broke up with Lucas, she met a young woman at her job named Sarah who was Messianic, Messianic Jew. Sarah had begun to share the Hebraic roots of the Messianic faith with her. Rachel was reluctant at first to attend her Messianic congregation, but a year later, Rachel finally decided to attend a Passover Seder with her friend from work on March 27, 1994. At this Passover Seder, Rachel met a young man named Joshua, whom she really liked, and they quickly became close friends. At this point, Rachel left her old church for good, and she began attending the Hebraic Roots Messianic congregation. Rachel and Joshua began to get to know one another by dating and talking on the phone every night. They studied the scriptures together every Sabbath day. And after the Sabbath was over, they went out to eat on Saturday nights. Later on that year, on May 16th, 1994, was their, was their Feast of Weeks Pentecost celebration at the congregation. At this celebration, there, were lots of, there was lots of joyous music, dancing, and Middle Eastern food. Rachel and Joshua had a wonderful time together that night as they became aware of the fact that perhaps Elohim was putting them together for marriage. That was also the first time that they kissed and Joshua told Rachel that he loved her. Rachel cried as she felt joy in her heart 
at her newfound love with Joshua. Later on that year, on September 6, 1994, Joshua and Rachel attended the Feast of Trumpets celebration at their congregation, also called Yom Teruah. This was a special time for them because it was also Joshua's 30th birthday. The entire congregation went out that night to a campsite where they would could watch for the new moon, sit around a campfire and sing songs, worship songs. When they spotted the moon, they all began to sound their shofars. At this precise moment, Joshua slipped the engagement ring on Rachel's finger as they looked up at the new moon. As Rachel felt the ring go on her finger, she began to cry and laugh at the same time. She and Joshua kissed and he whispered in her ear, Please marry me, Rachel. I love you. Rachel accepted and she replied with excitement, Yes, I will marry you, Joshua. Joshua picked her up off the ground and swung her around as they hugged and shouted for joy in front of the congregation. Everyone in the congregation sounded their shofars again and cheered for the couple as they took videos and pictures of this special event. Rachel and Joshua also celebrated Yom Kippur and the Feast of Tabernacles together that year at the campsite with their congregation as they had fond memories and laughs together. On the final night of the Feast of Tabernacles, Joshua told Rachel that he wanted to go away to Israel to study at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he told her that he would be back in time for Passover 1993, or 95, excuse me, you're right. <laughs> he said to her, I'm going away to prepare a place for you on my father's estate in Israel. And when I come back next year on Passover, I want to celebrate our one-year anniversary together of when we first met. And then let's set a date to get married on the Feast of Tabernacles of 1995 in Israel, okay? At this point, Rachel and Joshua made plans to be married one year later on the Feast of Tabernacles 1995 in Israel. By the first week of October, after the fall feast in 1994, Joshua went away to Israel to the Hebrew University while Rachel remained in the United States in their home state in Pennsylvania to plan their future wedding. Joshua and Rachel talked to one another via email, telephone, webcam daily as they continued to develop their relationship. Of course, this was in 1995. I, th I think they did have webcam in those days, but it was probably not quite that um did they have webcam in those days because <laughs> i just thought about that i wrote this it, into it the would have been pretty basic but i think they probably did yeah <laughs> it was more rare <laughs> joshua would periodically send rachel emails to remind her to send out invitations for their one-year anniversary party on passover 1995 he asked her to learn to cook the lamb and the unleavened bread for when he came home for passover the following year to celebrate their covenant with Messiah as well as their covenant with each other. Rachel was also learning how to cook Joshua's favorite meals as she, uh, as he informed her of what he liked and did not like. Joshua's taste in food was totally different than the kind of food Lucas enjoyed, but Rachel did not mind learning to cook differently for Joshua than she had for Lucas because she really loved Joshua. In the meantime, the anniversary date of when Lucas and Rachel had first met on October 31st was approaching. Rachel's friends and family missed her very much and they wanted her to come back to their church. They still loved Lucas and they there and they wanted them secretly to get back together again. They invited Rachel to a celebration at church for Halloween knowing that Joshua was away in Israel. They figured that they could use this time to scheme to bring Rachel back together with Lucas again. But Rachel did not know what they were planning to do. Therefore, she, uh, as, as they also invited Lucas to come to the celebration, Rachel's friends told her that they were going to be celebrating her new engagement to Joshua. And she believed them. But when she arrived at the Halloween celebration, even though they were singing songs about Joshua, the food being served was Lucas's favorite dishes. There were photos of Lucas and Rachel together all over the place. 
and other imagery and symbols of Lucas were attached to the celebration. Rachel felt grieved in her heart because she realized that Joshua would be hurt if he found out that she was attending this celebration. But she also rationalized to herself, Josh will understand. He knows my heart. And besides, it's not the date that matters. What matters is that I am celebrating Joshua from my heart. When Lucas showed up to this October 31st celebration, he pretended to be happy about Joshua and Rachel getting together, and he congratulated her on her engagement to Joshua. But secretly, Lucas was hoping to win Rachel back as he schemed together with her friends. At the same time, Joshua had been informed by his friends that Rachel was planning to attend this church Halloween party. Rachel's friends from her old church purposely tipped off one of Joshua's friends that she was attending their Halloween party because they were hoping to sabotage her relationship with Joshua and thereby give Rachel an excuse to return to Lucas. Joshua quickly got on an airplane and came home for a surprise visit from Israel. And when he arrived, he called Rachel's cell phone to find out where she was. Rachel answered her cell phone and told him that she was at a church celebration. Joshua replied, what kind of celebration? When she told him that she was celebrating October 31st as the date of their engagement, Joshua was very upset. Joshua said, wait, isn't that the date that you and Lucas first met and dressed up as Samson and Delilah? Rachel hesitated. Yes, but don't worry about the date. I'm celebrating this date for you and me now. Joshua showed up at the celebration and saw Lucas there. They were serving all of Lucas's favorite foods, playing Lucas's favorite music, and their church friends displayed old photos of Rachel and Lucas dressed up as Samson and Delilah when they had won that contest together. Joshua was so upset that he left the celebration in tears. Rachel went running after him as she tried to rationalize to him. But honey, this was all for you. But Joshua replied, Rachel, don't give me that. October 31st means nothing to you and me. That is the anniversary date of when you and Lucas first met and won a costume party, costume contest together. And aside from that, from the date, the food, the music, the photos, all of it reminded me of the fact that you used to be with Lucas. Rachel apologized to Joshua. Honey, I'm so sorry. They tricked me and told me they were celebrating the engagement of you and me together. And I believed them. I had no idea that Lucas was coming or that they were going to have photos of me and Lucas together and his favorite music and food, etc. Joshua understood that Rachel did this all in ignorance and he forgave her and all was forgotten. But he warned her not to attend any more of these celebrations with her old friends at church, knowing that they were trying to get her back together with Lucas. Joshua went back to Israel and again, he reminded her, remember this coming Passover, we are having a memorial of our engagement and when we first met. Rachel agreed to get everything ready with Joshua's friends and family for the Passover to commemorate their covenant with Messiah as well as when they first met the year before. Rachel had to forsake her old friends and family because they were conspiring to get her back together with Lucas. Rachel told her friends and family that she still loved them and forgave them for lying to her, but she was going to celebrate the appointed dates that Joshua asked her to keep with him. But in the meantime, Rachel's friends and family apologized to her for conspiring to get her back together with Lucas. But their apology was not sincere. They conspired once again to bring Rachel and Lucas back together. After all, Lucas was one of those good old boys from church, they told themselves. But this Joshua guy, who was a Messianic Jew, they thought 
He's just too legalistic with all of these appointed dates he expects her to keep. They did not want to give up the celebration of the festivals that they had become accustomed to, so they decided to attach Joshua's name to the dates that were formerly kept for Lucas and Rachel. That way, they could convince Rachel to continue to keep them, thereby making Joshua upset, and this would sabotage their relationship. What a brilliant plan they had! Each time one of these special uh, dates would come up that formerly meant something to Lucas, Rachel's friends and family would invite her and they told her that they were sorry for trying to interfere with her relationship with Joshua. Now they were going out of their way to convince Rachel that they were truly celebrating Joshua on these ap appointed dates of Lucas. Rachel decided to attend the Christmas party at her old church on December 25th, even though she knew this was Lucas's birthday. They did, they did all of this under the guise that this was going to once again be about Joshua. They told her that they would let her show videos of Joshua's trip to Israel and photos of their fall feasts together in front of the entire church. She rationalized, if I go to this party, I can show everyone at my old church the videos and pictures of Joshua and they will finally realize that I am with Joshua now and their efforts to get me back with Lucas are not going to work. This time, Joshua decided to show up again without her foreknowledge as he had once again been informed by his friends that Rachel was planning to attend one of these appointed feasts of Lucas under the guise of it being for him. Rachel did this willfully, knowing that Joshua, Joshua would be upset if he found out. But in her heart, she continued to rationalize, I'm doing this for Joshua. And so Joshua showed up to this December 25th celebration at Rachel's old church and saw that her family and friends were treating this as a day for Joshua. Even though Rachel showed them pictures of her celebration of the fall feast with Joshua, there were still vestiges of Lucas in the celebration. Once again, there were pictures of when Rachel and Lucas dressed up as Mary and Joseph for the live nativity scene two years earlier. Lucas's favorite foods were still being served. His favorite music, imagery, and symbols that meant something to Lucas, but not to Joshua. After Rachel showed the videos and pictures of Joshua's trip to Israel, someone else from the church brought out videos of their Christmas production two years earlier where Rachel and Lucas were dressed up as Mary and Joseph and they were dancing together and kissing. Joshua walked into this celebration just as they were showing videos of Rachel and Lucas. This time, Joshua showed up to the celebration he rebuked Rachel and he was very angry. Rachel, once again, tried to rationalize that she was doing it for him. But Joshua said to her, I am forbidding you to celebrate any more of these dates that commemorate Lucas. Do you hear me? If you celebrate one more of these Lucas days under the guise of it being for me, our relationship is over. Rachel began crying uncontrollably as she rationalized to Joshua, but I was showing them videos of your trip to Israel. I was doing this all for you, honey. I wanted them to finally get the hint that I'm not ever going back to Lucas. But Joshua said to her, Rachel, that is not the point. I already warned you last time when you attended that Halloween party on October 31st, not to attend any more of these celebrations with your friends that are supposed to be about me, but they are secretly about you and Lucas. Now Rachel was growing bitter towards Joshua as she felt that she had to choose between her friends and family or Joshua and his friends and family. Rachel felt that she should be able to celebrate both the appointed times that Joshua asked her to keep 
but also the appointed times that her friends and family wanted to keep under the guise of doing it for Joshua. Rachel began to say to herself, what difference do all these dates make? What really matters is that I love Joshua, right? Why can't I decide for myself when I want to plan dates to celebrate my love for Joshua? Why does he have to be the one to tell me when he wants to celebrate these appointed dates? Now Joshua gave her one more warning and said, if you attend any more of these special celebration dates of you and Lucas, our wedding is off. Do you hear me? Joshua went back to Israel, but before he left, he said to Rachel, this coming Passover is the one year anniversary of when we first met. And I want you to get ready by baking unleavened bread. And I want us to celebrate our one year anniversary of when we first met. So please don't let me down, Rachel. Please get all of our friends and family together for Passover and unleavened bread. Promise? Rachel agreed to get everything ready for Passover. But she was beginning to become bitter in her heart towards Joshua as she thought he was being such a legalist. She began saying to herself, my friends and family are right about him. He is way too legalistic. I should be allowed to go to these Lucas celebrations and take the day back for Joshua. Joshua once again went back to Israel, but while he was away, Rachel attended the Valentine's Day dance at her former church where her friends and family displayed pictures of Rachel and Lucas dancing together two years earlier. Rachel had no respect for how Joshua felt. She thought she should be allowed to celebrate these dates that commemorated her and Lucas's old relationship together, all the while rationalizing in her heart that she was doing these celebrations with Joshua in mind. One of Joshua's friends named Caleb followed Rachel to the church to spy on her for Joshua. Joshua's friend Caleb remained incognito and did not let Rachel know he was there. Caleb called Joshua on the phone and told Joshua that Rachel was at her old church celebrating Valentine's Day. Joshua decided this time to say nothing to her. He decided instead to fast and pray for his beloved that she would repent. He waited to see if she would confess to him that she dishonored him by going to another one of these Lucas celebrations at church. Joshua wanted to give her one more chance. He wanted to see if she would get everything together for Passover when he came home from Israel. Rachel had plenty of time to go shopping for Passover and unleavened bread celebration. Joshua rationalized to himself, I know she's all alone in my absence. Therefore, I can understand that she misses her old friends and family. However, once we get married and we move to Israel, things will be different. Those church people will be out of her life for good and her heart will be faithful to me at last. Rachel had not been attending her Messianic congregation as regularly as she had before. She would often sleep in on the Sabbath days and only attend once in a while. Rachel was beginning to lose touch with Joshua's friends and family, and she was not even trying to get things ready in time for Passover. When Passover had arrived that following April, Joshua came home from Israel, fully expecting that Rachel would have everything ready to celebrate their one-year anniversary of when they had first met. Joshua was very excited to celebrate with the woman he loved. Joshua could not wait to enjoy Rachel's home cooking as she would be preparing all of his favorite foods. But instead, Rachel had not prepared one bit. That year, in 1995, Easter Sunday fell on April 15th, and Passover fell the next day on April 16th. Rachel's friends invited her to come to the Easter production at church and celebrate with them to watch Lucas sing in the Easter play. She had been so busy celebrating the holidays that were important to Lucas that she had no time to prepare the Passover as Joshua had asked her to do. She had completely forgotten to go out and buy the ingredients to make the unleavened bread and the lamb. Now, this was the final blow for Joshua he was completely devastated that this woman whom he thought was going to be his bride had no respect for him whatsoever. Not only had she continued to celebrate the appointed times of Lucas 
while pretending that it was really for him. But now he, she defiantly disobeyed him and did not even prepare for the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread celebration that he asked her to prepare. In this story, Lucas represents Satan or Lucifer. Rachel represents the Christian church and Joshua represents Yahushua, who many know as Jesus. When Rachel continued in the appointed feasts of Lucas out of ignorance, Joshua forgave her and he understood that she didn't know any better. However, when Rachel persisted in celebrating the appointed dates of Lucas, even after she knew full well that it would hurt Joshua, he gave her fair warning not to do it again or he would have to call off their relationship and their wedding. But the final blow came when she disregarded an important date that Joshua was so looking forward to celebrating with her. She had already attended several of the celebrations of Lucas on the appointed dates that she and Lucas had formerly kept. And now she did not love Joshua enough to keep his appointed feasts. Can anyone blame Joshua if he breaks up with Rachel now? What do you think? To all those in the Christian church who say things like, God is not hung up on dates, or God knows my heart, or it doesn't matter what date, I can celebrate Jesus any day of the year as long as I'm celebrating him. Listen, Satan has had his counterfeit messiahs since the time of Nimrod at the Tower of Babel. All throughout the Bible, we see Yahuwah Elohim being angry with Israel because they were always forsaking him and going after these same pagan gods from Babylon and Egypt. In the scriptures, Yahuwah tells his people not to imitate or learn the same customs of the heathens and then try and say that you're doing it for him. Debarim or Deuteronomy 12 says, verse 30 and 31, Take heed to yourself that you be not snared by following them. After that they be destroyed from before you, and that you inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so, I will do likewise. You shall not do so unto Yahuwah your Elohim. For every abomination to Yahuwah, which he hates, have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters have they burnt in the fire to their gods. You see, Yahuwah basically says, if I may paraphrase, don't celebrate the pagan holidays of these other heathen deities and then try and say that you're doing it for me. You see, the heathens placed their infants into the arms of a bright red burning statue called Chemosh, the god of prosperity. They also placed into his arms a wish list, and they believed that if they offered up their children to this pagan god, they would receive the items on that wish list. And as you can see, these poor little children sitting in the lap of Santa Claus. Parents, when you do this, you are inadvertently subjecting yourself, these poor children, to being placed into the lap of Satan himself. I'm not saying that the man dressed up in the suit is Satan. I'm talking about the imagery. I'm talking about the, the ideology behind it. Santa is an anagram for Satan. And believe me, the occult world knows this. I'm not just making this up, okay? The occult world knows this. It's called an anagram. Christians may not be literally burning their children alive, but if they cause their children to become idolaters by idolizing Santa, which is actually Satan, they could be sending their children to the lake of fire in the future. So, you know, I had a, a, a couple, a married couple argue with me on Facebook the other day saying, we don't burn our children. We don't place our children offer up our children on a, on an altar, you know, with fire. I'm like, well, you're teaching your children idolatry, which ultimately they will go to the lake of fire. Okay. If you teach them idolatry, 
And um, okay, so that that uh, blog that I just clicked on that that's an old link. So I got to fix this link. Uh, so in Acts seven forty three, Yahuwah says, "Yea, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your god Remphan." Figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Okay, this is the statue of Moloch. It's like a giant statue, and it was stoked with wood. It was made out of iron, and it had a fire underneath, and the statue would get burning hot, and it would turn red. And they would put the baby in the arms of this burning statue. And so, you know, Kamosh is kind of like what Santa Claus looks like, a burning red statue. In Amos 5.21, we read about how Yahuwah sent Israel away to Damascus because of their pagan holidays. I already read this to you in Amos 5.21. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take you away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your vials. But let judgment rent down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have you offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? And then in verse 26, he says, but you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and your cune, your images, the star of your God, which you made to yourselves. Therefore, will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, says Yahuwah, whose name is the Elohim of hosts. And there you got on the top of the Christmas tree, the five pointed star of witchcraft. Okay, so when he talks about the star of your God, you know, a lot of people say it's the Jewish six-pointed star. Look, it doesn't really matter whether it's the six-pointed star or the five-pointed star. There's even an eight-pointed star that the Muslims use. Doesn't matter. The fact is we're not to worship created images at all. Now, just as a side note, I want you guys to understand, I'm not condoning anybody using images as a means of worship, right? Let me show you this real quick. Okay. Here's a picture of a pomegranate, right? At the top of the pomegranate is the six-pointed star, okay? When you pick a pomegranate, it's got a six-pointed star at the top. Now, I'm not saying that we should worship the star. Obviously, the, the heathens use this as a pentagram. Not a pentagram, I'm sorry, a hexagram. Excuse me. So in witchcraft, they will draw this six-pointed star onto the floor and they will put a circle around it and they will stand inside each point on the hexagram and they will perform witchcraft with it. But it's all in the way it is used. You see, there's a picture of our Messiah seen in this star. Our Messiah is symbolized by the pomegranate in Haggai chapter 219. The pomegranate contains many seeds which symbolizes the seed of Abraham. Galatians 3.29 says that if we belong to Messiah, we are Abraham's seed. The seeds also represent great drops of blood. Remember, the night before he died, our Messiah sweated great drops of blood when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he died. He will be dressed in a garment dipped in blood. It says in Revelation 19, 13, you know, when you eat a pomegranate, how it stains your clothes. Um, it says he will be wearing a crown in Revelation 14, 14. He will be wearing a crown on his head when he returns. The pomegranate stains your clothes red when you break it apart and it is in the shape of a globe. This is one of the things he showed me when I was praying about the whole flat earth thing. He said, look at everything I've created has spherical shape to it. There's nothing he's created that's flat. Yahuwah is a, he is an Elohim of dimension. Everything he created has mass. Okay. Um, so on top of the globe is the crown. Yahushua is a picture. He is the king of the world. Okay, Revelation eleven fifteen says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Messiah. 
Okay. The bells at the bottom of the priestly garments were made to look like pomegranates. So, you know, the pomegranate has a purpose and the, the six pointed star is not inherently evil unless you use it that way, unless you worship the star. Stars are not evil in and of themselves. It's if you worship the star. Okay. So eight pagan Sabbaths that commemorate Baal each year. What are these holidays that Yahuwah hated in Amos 5.21? What caused him to send them away into captivity? Well, ever since the Tower of Babel, these same pagan holidays were kept on these specific dates. And I'll show you the Yule will. We can see that there are eight pagan Sabbaths that the witches and occultists keep for Baal or Satan. The pagan solar wheel is sectioned out into eight sections like a pie. At two of the solstices, the winter and the summer, and at two of the equinoxes, the spring and the fall, are dates that commemorate the time when the nation of Israel went whoring after the same pagan deities and surrounding nations. These same pagan holidays were later repackaged, recycled, and renamed to appear as holidays to celebrate quote unquote, Jesus Christ by Rome. In this story, Rachel wanted to celebrate the holidays that commemorated her former lover, Lucas. Okay. She tried to rationalize that he was, she was doing this for Joshua, just like Christians say, but I'm doing it for Christ. But he was not happy about it at all. This is exactly what the Christian church has done today. And they think that our Messiah doesn't mind Okay, and right here, you can see the po pagan solar wheel. I can't enlarge it because when I click on it, it won't get larger here. But you, you get the picture. Valentine's Day uh, in, in on the pagan solar wheel, they call it in bulk. Then there's Ostara, which is Easter. Rome changed it to Passover week to identify Easter with Messiah's resurrection. But it's really secretly about Easter's resurrection. Then there's Beltane, which is Mayfest, the Queen of Heaven. Now, I remember in the Catholic Church, on May 1st, when we were little kids, the nuns would have us um, tie ribbons around a pole, and we would do a Maypole dance, and we would dance around the, the Asherah pole with these ribbons in honor of the Queen of Heaven. It would be a giant statue of Mary, and we would dance around her with these ribbons, okay? They made the little kids do this. Then there's the midsummer solstice, which is the first day of summer, June 21st. In the Catholic Church, they call it St. John's Day. Um, I guess because, you know, they supposedly St. John the Baptist was born around this time, but actually he was born on Passover. So they got that date wrong. Uh, then there's this other pagan holiday, Lug Nazad, which is... In the Catholic Church, they call it Mary's Ascension. They said that Mary ascended just like Yahushua did. That's false. There's no record in Scripture that she ascended back to the Father. She's going to resurrect when the rest of us resurrect. When the rest of, the rest of us gets, gets our, you know, incorruptible bodies, that's when she's getting hers. Okay. Uh, May Bon, first day of autumn, September 21st. Sawin, even though it's spelled with an M, it's pronounced Sawin. Um, Halloween, the Catholic Church calls it All Saints Day, okay, or All Souls Day. Why? Because in the occult world, they say that the line is the thinnest between the natural world and the supernatural world. And they say that on All Saints Day, that's the special time when you can have contact with the dead. So this is an abomination. And then you have Yule on the pagan sabbath wheel yule which is christmas birthday of false christs so the december 21st which is the winter solstice leading up to december 25th when they claim that the sun is reborn so ancient israel did the same thing to yahuwah that rachel did to joshua in this story he was patient with her and gave her many chances to amend her ways even He even went away to Israel to prepare a place for her on his father's estate. But she was ungrateful. She was unrepentant. She was rebellious. 
In Jeremiah 3, 8, Yahuwah wrote Israel a divorce decree and sent her away to the nations for her harlotry and backsliding. You know, has anything changed today in the Christian church? You know, in 1 Samuel 15, 22, we are told obedi obedience is better than sacrifice. Well, Christians brag about the fact that they lift up holy hands and worship with intimacy. They often criticize the Hebrew roots people or the Jewish people that, you know, keep the holy days and the appointed feasts. They call it legalism. But who loves Yahuwah? Those who obey or those who sacrifice? You know, the feasts of Yahuwah are like the engagement ring. Our keeping our weekly Sabbath with him is like our engagement ring. We are showing the world who we are in covenant with. If you are keeping pagan holidays, you are in covenant with the papacy, the Vatican, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of all harlots. But if you are in covenant with the creator of the universe and Elohim, the Elohim of Israel, Yitzhak, and Jacob, then you will wear the sign of the covenant upon your right hand or, or and upon your forehead. Okay, in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 8, it says, Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah our Elohim is one Yahuwah, and you shall love Yahuwah with your, Elo, your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I, which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently unto your children and shall talk of him when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. In other words, our hands represent our deeds, our works, because we work with our hands. The frontlets between your eyes that's your forehead, and this means your mind. If we will have the mind of Messiah, we will desire to keep his commandments. And then one last scripture, and then we're going to go ahead and take some Q&A time. Okay, in Shemot, Exodus 21, it says, Speak you also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am Yahuwah that does sanctify you and you shall keep the Sabbath therefore for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defiles it shall surely be put to death for whosoever does any work therein, that soul should be cut off from his people. Six, six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to Yahuwah, whosoever does any work in the Sabbath day he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, Yahuwah made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Also, in Yehezkel, Ezekiel twenty twelve, it says, Moreover, also, I gave them Sabbaths, to be a sign between me and them, that they may know that I am Yahuwah that sanctify them. And then also in verse 20, he says, And hallow set my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. And the word sign here in these passages is the Hebrew word ot, and it means a signal. It means a beacon, a monument. An omen, a prodigy, evidence, mark, miracle, token. Okay? So, um, you know, on the day of Shabuot or Pentecost, the believers received the seal of the Ruach HaKodesh, which is also called the law of the spirit of life. Romans 8, 2 talks about the law of the spirit of life has freed us from the law of sin and death. Okay? So Christians always say we're freed from the law. He's not talking about the law of Moses. We've been freed from the law of sin and death. Okay. This means that the Torah is written in our hearts and minds by the Ruach HaKodesh, by the Holy Spirit. The commandments have been transferred from stone tablets into fleshy tables of the heart. Second Corinthians 3, 3. 
the seal of the the Ruach HaKodesh, the seal of the Holy Spirit that Yahuwah places on his elect is a down payment. It's an engagement ring, if you will. The word for seal is in the Hebrew is kotam, and it means a signature ring. In other words, his name, a signature ring, a seal, a signet. In uh, Shir Hasharim, Song of Solomon 8, 6, it says, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which has a most vehement flame. In Isaiah, Yeshayahu 8, 16, it says, Bind up the testimony, seal the Torah among my disciples. Okay, so I'm going to stop right here. There's more to this, but um, I don't want to take up more time that belongs to our Q&A. Yeah, so go ahead and stick around. Uh, why don't you give a, a sign off and then we'll do Q&A after. Everyone, thank you for joining and may Yahuwah be with you. Shabbat Shalom, Shavuot Tov. Have a good week. Yahuwah bless you and keep you. Yahuwah make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon you and give you Shalom. We hope you've enjoyed today's broadcast and that you are encouraged in your walk with Messiah. For more teachings, subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell to be notified of our latest content. Visit Maria's many blogs at doubleportioninheritance.com. That's doubleportioninheritance.com. This ministry is made possible by the prayers and support of listeners like you. To make a donation by PayPal or Venmo.com, Use the email address doubleportioninheritance at gmail.com. That's doubleportioninheritance at gmail.com. On behalf of Maria and Gary at Double Portion Inheritance Ministries, may Yahuwah bless you.